Your recent book, Quantum Healing, is filled with the mystery, wonder, and hope of men and women who have experienced seemingly miraculous recoveries from cancer and other serious illnesses. As a respected New England endocrinologist educated in Western medical methods, you began your real search for answers when you saw patients in your own practice completely recover after being given, by responsible estimates, only months to live. How do you approach serious cases such as cancer, heart disease, and AIDS? Well, the way I approach anybody else, I look at not so much the disease, but the person who has the disease. Uh, it's all right to know what the disease is. In fact, it's important to know what the disease is. Much more important to know this person who has the disease. A person is the end product of all their experiences. I would say they're the end product or metabolic end product of all their experiences. Experiences are through the five senses of sound, touch, taste, smell, sight, etc. These literally shape the texture, the rhythm, the form of our mind. And our mind ultimately projects itself as the body. We have the most exquisite pharmacy in the body that makes all kinds of drugs. Yes. Tranquilizers, antibiotics, anti-cancer drugs, yes. heart pills, antihypertensives, you name it, the body makes it. Makes it at the right time, precise dosage, uh, for the right target organ, no side effects, it's free, and all the instructions are in the packaging. So what I do with my patients is activate and amplify their own healing response. You say miraculous uh, recoveries from cancer. Well, really, that's yesterday's miracle, it's today's science. The fact is that all of us are miraculously recovering from cancer every day. We turn over 500 billion cells a day. A small percentage of these are mutations. So we have cancer cells in our body all the time. But the vast majority of us don't get cancer because we make the appropriate drugs inside us. These are called interleukins, interferons, etc. We make them all the time and we are all the time recovering from cancer because we have cancer cells inside us. Amplify that a little bit and you have a quotes unquote miracle. That's yesterday's miracle, it's today's science. Um, you can activate this pharmacy inside through a variety of techniques. And I use transcendental meditation, primordial sound, music therapy, aroma therapy, a form of massage therapy that activates healing substances from the skin. Uh, I use um, group dynamics of consciousness, use herbs to activate the pharmacy inside, uh, understand people as psychophysiological entities modulate their diet so that it's appropriate for their body type, uh, restore their biological rhythms. There's a wide variety of methods. Mm -hmm. But it is true, we treat patients with heart disease, we can get them off their usual uh, medications and restore, in fact, uh, blood flow to the heart and even reverse it. There's published data on that. Um, it is also true that many cancers do go spontaneously into regressions. You can amplify that. And it is also true that many people have uh, HIV disease, the AIDS virus, but they don't have the expression of the disease. In fact, I have many patients with AIDS who are healthier than most of the people walking down the street. They haven't had a cold in five years. The f basic premise is that we have a healing system inside us and it can be amplified through a variety of uh, non-pharmacological, non-materialistic approaches. That's very interesting. Did these people choose their own illness? I would say they didn't choose their own illness, they participated in their illness. There's a difference be between making um, a, a choice and being totally responsible for something uh, and participating in a process. Perhaps they participated more than others did. But all illness that we see in a society, we are all participants in it. The drug manufacturers who put carcinogens in the food, the people and politicians who allow that to happen, um, the consumer who uses sprays and shoots up holes in the ozone, uh, all of us are participants. 
uh, the medical profession that knowing that these preventive measures uh, will prevent such a lot of disease that nevertheless allow it to happen. And of course, the person who for whatever reasons, either because he's ignorant of the facts or because he's been indoctrinated into a certain lifestyle, um, participates in it too. So I would say they didn't choose it as much as they participated in it. And to the extent we can change their participation, and we can, that will um, uh, have an effect on the illness. That's a good approach. What about inherited diseases? Can we change that? Can you change that? Well, one, let's say we can change the expression of inherited tendency. Uh, after all, a lot of people have the inherited traits for a certain, or predisposition to a certain disease, but they don't all get it. And there are so many environmental factors. About 10% of all disorders are genetic, so-called genetic mm -hmm. disorders. Even there, I think you can, by modulating a person's lifestyle, changing their diet, reducing the stress in their lives, you can alter the expression. And many people who have a strong family history of cancer, they don't all get cancer. A lot of people have strong family history of heart disease, they don't all get heart disease. So I think if there is a genetic predisposition, if you're more alert than usual, you certainly can influence the expression, no question about it. Good. Medical science has known that spontaneous remissions occur but why and how? Medical science has known uh, that spontaneous remissions occur but hasn't paid too much attention to them in the past simply because they were rare. Um, it was said, well, it's an anomaly. It doesn't fit the usual pattern, so let's ignore it. Well, precisely because it's an anomaly is why we should study it because if we could mm -hmm. find out the mechanism, then sure. we can replicate it in other people. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, there's been a lot of interest in these spontaneous remissions. There's an institute in California, in Sausalito, called the Institute of Noetic Sciences. I know that. Yeah. They've collected data on it, and they've documented at least 3,000 spontaneous remissions just in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it's fact that scientists are looking at them, looking at the mechanism, and the mechanism is precisely what I mentioned earlier, an amplification of a normal self-correcting homeostatic response. And you can maximize that by reducing the stress in a person's life, by modulating his diet, and by restoring his biological rhythms. Can uh, positive visualizations or the will to live also produce them? I think to a limited extent, yes. Some people are good visualizers and some are terrible. <laughs> and those who are terrible, it causes more stress than it removes. So I'm not one of those advocates of positive visualization. I also don't uh, recommend uh, positive attitude as a form of mood making. It's just a lot of stress. You're positive, if you're positive and feeling good inside, you can't make a mood of it. In fact, you make a mood of it, you're going to have more stress. So the answer is that uh, these techniques have limited applicability. There's nothing like a fundamental mutation in consciousness which is possible, which can alter a biological expression of disease. And I believe that that happens through meditation. I myself have been practicing transcendental meditation for 10 years, so I know that it's possible to transcend thought, to become a silent witness of the whole thinking process, and merely doing that is enough. A quiet mind is more important than a positive mind. It's enough to have a silent mind. And when the mind is silent, then the body is silent, and wonderful things happen. Inner energies wake up spontaneously and bring about miracles without our having to try to make a positive mood. That's a lot of hype, I personally think. Do you get more consistent results that way? I get v much more consistent results. I wish they were more consistent. <laughs> so obviously um, there is a lot more to learn and a lot more to do. But certainly we get a lot of results consistently if we if we stop thinking of disease as a linear cause-effect thing, a disease happens because there's so many things going on in a person's life. And there are relationships, there are his diet, there's the way he lives, what time he wakes up, uh, what kind of work he does. A uh, human being is a composite of millions of experiences, not to mention genetic predisposition and millions of years of evolutionary time. 
So one, one takes the whole thing holistically at the level of environment, body, mm-hmm. mind and consciousness. I think one has a more reasonable approach. You talk in your book, Quantum Healing, about kidneys thinking and intelligence all over your body. Every cell's voice is valuable. Can you please explain that? Yeah, we've sort of tended to equate the mind with the intellect and the rational mind. Uh, Certainly that's an aspect of mind, but if we define mind or intelligence as know-how, as the ability to respond to a stimulus, or even as the ability to respond with a wide range of choices to one stimulus, or as the ability to self-correct a fault, then of course mind is everywhere. It's not localized to the nervous system. And there's been a lot of research recently that shows that in fact thoughts have chemical equivalents that are called neuropeptides, and these peptides are not confined to brain cells, they're in all the cells of our body. So we have a thinking body, and it turns out it's part of the thinking universe. You returned to your native India in the mid-80s to explore Ayurveda, humanity's most ancient healing tradition. How did you combine that knowledge with current Western medical research, neuroscience, and physics, and come up with quantum healing? Well, I already had a good background in physics and neuroscience and endocrinology, which is my field, and endocrinology is one of those fields which interfaces, you know, mind with matter. Here Mm -hmm. are these wonderful chemicals that have energy soup on the one side and um, material soup on the other side. And so the endocrine system literally interfaces both mind and matter. I had that background. And when I returned to India and discovered Ayurveda, uh, I found that in fact, the knowledge in Ayurveda was already there as an experiential set of exercises that allowed you to experience both the mind and the body as uh, aspects of your own consciousness. That in fact, uh, mind and body are inseparably one in every aspect of our physiology, in every aspect of the universe. They're two sides of the same coin. Is the basis of Ayurveda that its methods imitate nature, divorced from technology, based on wisdom? There's a difference between information, knowledge and wisdom and I think it's, I'm glad you point that out. Information is sort of random and uh, random and chaotic. It's still, there is some technical know-how there but it's random and chaotic. Uh, Knowledge is more complete. Um, It gives us more the ability to solve a certain solution but it ignores the total picture. Wisdom is knowledge in the context of the whole. So when you isolate a certain drug, for example, an active ingredient out of a plant, Ayurveda would say that's like taking the intelligence, the knowledge out, but leaving the wisdom behind. And when you use the whole plant, for example, then you maximize its therapeutic to toxic potential or ratio because the so-called non-active ingredients are also bioactive in that they minimize toxicity and enhance the healing. Ayurveda looks at the human being as the microcosm of the whole universe. In fact, there's a very beautiful expression, as is the atom, so is the universe. As is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, so is the cosmic mind. And that the inner intelligence of the body is the ultimate and supreme genius it mirrors the wisdom of the universe. Mm -hmm. If we could match this intelligence with the universe, then we would see that we are a balanced ecology that literally mirrors the ecology of of the planet. Yeah, uh, on the other hand, uh, I think you've also said that doctors don't normally help nature. uh, You might almost say that they strangle nature. There's an old expression in medicine, I'm sure you've heard of it, nature cures and the doctor sends the bill. (laughs) Uh, The fact is that most of the illnesses that uh, people have, 80% of the illnesses are um, self-limiting. In fact, 80% of all the diseases or drugs that we use for common diseases 
are quotes and quotes optional or marginal, which means if you didn't do a thing, wouldn't make a bit of a difference except save you some money and side effects. Sure. So I think a good doctor who understands that would be much more selective in the use of his drugs. And if anything, he would strive to activate the patient's own healing responses so that the process would be much more natural. Most of the drugs we have are in any case symptomatic. They treat symptoms or at best they interfere with the mechanism of disease. The mechanism of disease is not the cause of disease or the origin of disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you say that quantum healing is the ability of one mode of consciousness, the mind, to spontaneously correct the mistakes in another mode of consciousness, the body. Right. How does quantum healing really work? Well, let's define a quantum. What's a quantum? A quantum of light is a photon. It's mm -hmm. this, according to Stephen Hawking, the authority on yeah. quantum physics, I sure. guess, uh, quantum is the smallest indivisible unit in which waves are emitted or absorbed. So a quantum of light is a photon, a quantum of electricity is an electron. These days we have quanta of gravity, they call them gravitons and so on. Yeah. Uh, a quantum of the mind-body unit is an impulse of intelligence. I hesitate to call it a thought because we, we think of thoughts as fully verbalized expressions um, that have a certain elite status in mm -hmm. our consciousness. Feelings, emotions, desires, instincts, drives, intentions, ideas, notions, concepts, likes, dislikes, prejudices, these are all quantum units mm -hmm. of the mind-body connection. They constantly shape the rhythm and texture of both the body and the mind. Right. How does the, how does the individual cell connect with the cosmos? The individual cell is part of the cosmic body. And my body is part of the cosmic body. In fact, um, it's not that it has to connect. It's like asking, how does my toe connect with my foot? It's already it's there. Part of it. It's part of it. And f there's a lot of research that shows, in fact, that the biological rhythms that we have in our system literally mirror the cosmic rhythms of our universe. For example, the circadian rhythm, the circle, the rhythm that occurs as a um, night and day, follows the pattern of night and day, mm -hmm. is a result of the movement of the Earth on its own axis. Now, this causes the body to undergo dramatic and intense transformations in a 24-hour period. Not just the human body, but anything. You give an animal a certain dose of radiation at 6 o'clock in the morning, it may kill him. You give the same dose of radiation at 6 in the evening, it has a beneficial effect. Because it's not the same body at 6, and because it's following the patterns of the universe. So too, as the Earth moves around the sun, um, there are seasonal changes that bring about changes in our body. So you fall in love in spring or get depressed in winter. Mm -hmm. it's a, there's a biological effect there sure. that's going on. The lunar month, which is a result of the gravitational effects of the sun and the moon, um, and the movement of the earth, moon, and sun in relationship to each other, causes rhythmic changes in the body. So do the tides, because there's an ocean inside us, which is the same as the primordial ocean outside us. We came from it. So the fact is that the human cell is in fact a mirror in every aspect of it. Structural, morphological, ultrastructural, physiological, biochemical, it mirrors the ecology. The, the, there's an intimate relationship that we have with the universe. And in fact, it's our intellect that sort of fools us into thinking, oh, we are outsiders and if we are scientists, then of course we are even more of the outsiders because we're totally objective and not affected by it. But we can't get outside it because we are already inside it. Uh, concerning our innate ability to get well, how can we avoid blocking that ability? Yeah, the ability is innate and it has evolved over eons of time. If you encounter a pneumococcus, for example, and even if you haven't ever encountered one in your life, your genetic memory goes back to the first time any human being in prehistoric time encountered that pneumococcus, has that memory to evoke the precise antibody 
to tackle that organism. Right. If you encounter a carcinogen, you encounter millions of them in your environment every day, your body knows the precise mechanism so as not to get hurt by that carcinogen. And what we do is we interfere with that mechanism mainly through three things. How we think, how we behave and how we eat. We could take care of these three areas in our life, stress, biological rhythms and nutrition basically then I think we could avoid 80 to 90 percent of all illness. Yeah, that sounds good. How can happiness or the inner state of bliss help us prevent or cure disease? Well, the fact is that all human endeavor, no matter what it is, is there because we think it will bring us happiness. You make money, you seek power, you seek fame, possessions, love, compliments, whatever. You do it because you think it will make you happy. So we might say that happiness is the goal of all goals. Mm -hmm. Why not go for happiness in the first place? We have the idea that things will give us happiness. Ultimately happiness is a result of a state of fulfillment in our nervous system. And I personally think that our happiness is our ground state. We go to objects and refer to them in order to get that experience of fulfillment. But once we learn that the only way to actually have complete power over anything in the universe is to be self-referral, not to identify with situations, circumstances, people or things, that comes about, by the way, as a natural process of transcending of meditation, then spontaneously we experience our inner bliss. And I think there is a distinction between happiness and bliss and I'm glad you mentioned that. Happiness is usually for a reason. Somebody says something nice to you or you win the lottery or you get a new job. Bliss is without reasons. It's just the sheer joy of being alive in this universe which has sun, moon, stars, the wind and you and me. It's like a state of being, perhaps? It's the state of being, beyond thought, transcending, yes. Mm -hmm. How does your body type analysis explain predispositions to future diseases? Yeah, I think we all recognize that we are in unique individuals. No two people react to the same stimulus the same way. Nevertheless, there are certain tendencies. We know the kind of person, for example, who says, all I have to do is look at food and I gain weight. And the other extreme who says, well, I can eat anything I want, nothing happens. Or you're in one room and there are three different people and one feels that it's very cold and drafty, another person thinks it's in fact warm, a third person thinks it's humid. They're all responding differently to the same stimulus. We have unique individualities uh, that are operational at all levels, biochemical, uh, physiological, emotional, psychological. Um, so having an idea of this psychophysiological tendency or propensity allows an Ayurvedic physician to tailor the therapy according to a person's body type. And that includes the kind of diet he'll give him. That includes the kind of daily and seasonal routine he'll give him. That includes the kind of medicine he might give him or the dosage of the medicine that he might give him. So it influ that includes uh, the kinds of music or sounds he might recommend or colors he may recommend or even things like aroma and massage that he may recommend. And therefore, this idea of psychophysiological body typing, of profiling you as a unique individual, is one that gets a lot of importance in Ayurveda. It allows us to tailor therapy very uniquely and specifically to you. As I said earlier, it's important to know what disease you have, but it's more important to know who has the disease. But can we change our body types? No, we can't change our body types. What we can do is restore the balance in our body types, and that is more than enough. In other words, to get in touch with our... to live effortlessly, Mm -hmm. and comfortably is to respect our individuality. And we can do that by understanding our body type. So can we really avoid sickness and attain health? 
I definitely believe so, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Okay. Uh, I think um, uh, health is a state of positive well-being, not just the absence of sickness. And that positive state of well-being extends to all levels, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. It's the harmonious interaction of all the elements and forces that make us who we are. And I think it's not only achievable, I think it's our ground state. If anything, the fall from grace, mm. um, the popular expression, is that we lost the memory of health. Once you restore the memory of health, there's no going back. It's like a child that's born can't return to the womb. Well, that's a good message. Can you really heal any and all diseases with awareness and control of the in invisible patterns that steer the body? I think we should say we can alter the expression of any and all disease. There are certain limitations and they go by certain names. Um, there are certain genetic limitations sometimes. Um, and uh, they too can be influenced. So I would say we can alter the expression of any and every disease. Can you avoid stress in your work and your personal life? I don't have stress in my life at all and I'm being totally honest about that. It doesn't mean I'm not exposed to stimuli that would, could be interpreted as stress, but I don't empower those stimuli. I don't waste my energy over them. In other words, I don't refer to them. I don't relinquish my power to them. So I don't have the stress. And that, I think, is achievable by anybody and everybody. Right. You're recommending meditation for a healthy life. Even though others warn against getting in touch with energies that one can control. Is that a problem? No, I think people have fear of the unknown. What they should really fear is the known. The known is all the past training they've had that's locked them into a certain reality. The unknown is what we should be stepping into in every moment of our existence. Then life would become much more exciting. Meditation is a way in, uh, of taking us to that level of awareness from where thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires emerge. And there's nothing like uh, transcending. As I told you, I've practiced transcendental meditation for almost 10 years now, and I can tell you there's nothing like getting in touch with yourself. And that's what meditation is. People have all kinds of preconceived notions about it and a fear of it that comes about from not really knowing what it is. Mm -hmm. If the energies wake up, so what? You are the one who controls them. Or you feel in every case we can control the I think the that more energy. awareness you have and the more self-aware you ha uh, are, the more you're spontaneously in control. It's not some manipulative type of control. It's a spontaneity of self-referral. It's, uh, it's feeling that you control your mind, your body, your environment. You're not the victim, but you're the boss. Right. Why not? Well, sure. Can the memory of good health returning bring with it enough power to last a lifetime? Yes. As I said to you, it's like a child being born cannot return to the womb. Once there is that mutation in consciousness, there's a biological mutation and it's irreversible. Um, it's it's uh, being high on yourself. Yeah, but that memory of good health is something that we somehow put away. We, we don't carry it with us. All we don't the time. carry it with us because our mind is object referral. It refers constantly to objects in the environment and it identifies with them. If we can make a certain perceptual shift where instead of object referral, we become self referral, then there's spontaneity of that memory, not just as an intellectual exercise but as an experiential knowingness that you're grounded in, in every moment of your life, even dream and sleep. Mm -hmm. You say that the body is a three-dimensional physical picture of our thoughts. Yes, uh, as I again mentioned earlier, thoughts are impulses of intelligence that arise from the ocean of consciousness and then in fact manifest themselves on a material level 
as these chemicals, these neuropeptides. Ne neuropeptide is not a good word because they're not confined to the brain, they're everywhere. So every time, let's say you have the experience of fear in a dark alley, uh, that experience of fear takes physical shape in the form of adrenaline, uh, spurting not only from your adrenal gland, but from every cell in your body. Mm -hmm. If you have the experience of exhilaration, then that exhilaration takes physical form as interleukin, interferon, which are very powerful anti-cancer drugs, by the way. You make tons of them when you feel exhilarated. If you feel tranquil, then that tranquility takes physical form as the generation of a Valium-like substance in your body. So all impulses of intelligence, which are fluctuations in consciousness, which express themselves as thought, feeling, desire, emotion, in fact, structure the body, and the body is that three-dimensional projection. There's an ancient saying in Ayurveda, I interact with myself and experience myself subjectively as the mind. I interact with myself, experience, experience myself objectively mm -hmm. right. as my body. But it's nothing other than myself. That's all there is. My body is me, and my mind is me, and in fact, it's my own creation. Mm -hmm. That's very good. There's another beautiful saying that says, if you want to know the condition of your mind in the past, examine your body now. If you want to know what your body will look like in the future, examine your mind now. How does the future for medical science look? I think the future is going to be very exciting. On the one hand, we're going to see an explosion in technology, which will make diagnostic procedures even more precise than they are today. But on the other hand, we'll become much more cost conscious, so we'll use them more sparingly and hopefully without the side effects that we get when you, we use them injudiciously. I think medical technology will advance to the extent where in fact we can handle any kind of acute emergency and I think that's a great boon. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I will see that for most of the chronic diseases and most of the ills that humanity is plagued by, we will not depend on technology. We will depend on the innate healing powers of the individual. And the future patient will be one who's adept at becoming his own healer. First of all, with an emphasis on prevention. And secondly, should that, for some reason, not be effective, to evoke the healing response from within, to activate this internal pharmacy which is more ex exquisite than any multinational company can come up with. Very good. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting well, interview. Thank you for having me here. It was very enjoyable.